Thanks to Weights and Biases for supporting my channel. Welcome back to this month's AI 101 where we'll be learning about synthetic data generation. If you're new to my channel, AI 101 is a roughly monthly series where we go through practical coding tutorials on different topics that are of interest to all of you. If you'd like to follow along, you can do so using the collab notebook link down below. And if there's a topic that you'd like for me to cover in the future, you can let me know in the comments. Before we get into the coding though, let's talk about synthetic data generation and why it might be useful for you. As you might guess, synthetic data is data created via means other than direct measurement of whatever the task or system that you're focusing on is. For our purposes, synthetic data is usually data that we generate in order to increase the size of our training data or to introduce changes in the data that you'd like your model to be able to handle in the future. And we don't technically need synthetic data, but as we've talked about in other videos, a lot of the advancements when it comes to deep learning over the last 20 years are in part because we have access to much, much larger data sets than we did in the past. We need these very large data sets in order to have enough information to properly train a deep learning model. And while we do have these large data sets for some tasks, there are other tasks where we don't, and we might need to generate more data in order to reasonably train a model. Alternatively, getting access to that extra data might be expensive or time consuming in a way that doesn't make sense for the type of project that you're working on. So synthetic data offers us a cheaper and usually more time efficient method of expanding our data set. It can also help us rebalance data sets if the distribution of the data that we have doesn't match the distribution of that data in real life, or can help us focus on rarer cases that you might find in the data that might be particularly important to get right or wrong, such as in medical diagnostics. However, it's important to remember that synthetic data is synthetic, and so models trained on synthetic data cannot immediately be translated into real life use. One example of this is OpenAI's project on solving a Rubik's Cube with a robot hand. The model used to control the hand was initially trained on simulation, succeeding on the task about 90% of the time, and then was translated to the real world task where the success rate dropped to about 60% of the time with a much wider variance. So this is all to say that while synthetic data can be useful for some applications, there's a non-trivial jump between training models on synthetic data and using them in real life. And that jump will require a lot of extra work. As usual, we're gonna be working in collab. And if you'd like to follow along via collab, I'd actually recommend making a copy of the notebook and saving it into your drive so that you can make changes as needed. Starting from the top, we're going to import a bunch of stuff that will help us out, including the weights and biases library. If you haven't already heard of them, weights and biases makes developer tools for machine learning. And I'm actually really excited to be working with them for this video because they make a really awesome set of products. So as usual, when you want to get started, you just click on the arrow in the top left-hand corner, and that will also, if you're using weights and biases, show you this big panel that will help you see all of your metrics as they run in real time. And as you can also see, it will also show you how you can access the documentation page, which I will show you guys in a second, and you can see some of my earlier tests with this here which records all of your runs and everything that you've used as parameters so that you can compare different versions of different models in terms of how they perform with different parameters, which is pretty cool. I'll talk about all the different things that you can do with our library towards the end of the video, but for now we're mostly going to focus on using it for data visualization and tracking the metrics for our models. Next, we're gonna start off with something simple. So this is a great example if you are just getting into machine learning and you want to generate fairly straightforward clustering data sets or classifying data sets. So we're going to be using sklearn. And sklearn has this method called make classification where you can basically give it a bunch of different information about the kind of data set you wanna make. So we're going to make a data set that has two features, mostly because it's just easier to plot that, that has no redundant features and has two classes. So we can divide this into two classes. We're then going to split our data set up front so that we have our training data and our test data. And then you'll see over in the weights and biases section, but I'm basically making a scatter plot here so that we can just see what our data set looks like and get an idea of where it's going to split. And so as you can see, we're starting to see all of our figures show up here. So this is the data set that we created. You can see that it's not linearly separable, so there's no linear line that you can run through that in order to evenly separate all of the data set. However, you could probably draw a line that would get a lot of both sides classified correctly, and so that is what our model is trying to do. But in short, this is a really great simple example of synthetic data because it is synthesized data. It essentially means nothing. It can have whatever distribution you want it to. It can mean whatever you are interested in having it mean, but it's a great way to start off if you are new to machine learning and you just want some data sets to play with. sklearn also has a bunch of other types of classification data generators. So you can make 
Gaussian data, you can make different clusters if you want to do unsupervised learning. So there's a lot of great options there for beginners who just want some data to play around with and aren't ready for bigger data sets yet. Next up, we're going to focus on a type of synthetic data that we've actually talked about a bit in my how to make your first neural network video. This is going to look actually at the Fashion MNIST data set, which is a data set of different items of clothing in 28 by 28 pixel images. And the goal here is to classify the 10 different classes of clothing that they provide to us here. So we're going to load our data. As you can see, we have a bunch of different clothing items that I just picked out of the data set. And as you can also see, you can save this in the weights and biases log. So in an earlier version, I was able to save this image here so that you can always have access to it. Going on, we're going to develop our model. This is actually the same model that I used in the first neural network video. I changed a couple little things just because I'm importing the data a little bit differently this time, but it's pretty straightforward. And the big weights and biases change here is that if you use this parameter, weights and biases will automatically track all the metrics for your model and plot them for you. And so you don't have to make separate plots or do anything like that, which is awesome. So if you wanna learn more about this model, you can check out my video on how to make your first neural network. I'm not gonna to get too much into it now, but in short, we're making a convolutional neural network that has two layers and this just summarizes it so we can see what kind of network we made. So while the model's training, we can talk a little bit about why I'm showing you this example after I showed you the example where you can just pull data out of thin air. In this example, we're actually doing data augmentation. So what I'm gonna do in one of the next steps is use a method that Keras has, which allows you to change your data set in a bunch of different ways from rotation to horizontal and vertical flips to size changes. And the idea here is that we're trying to synthesize more data than we originally had in different configurations than what we originally had. So in the original example data set that we saw, you can see that all of the items of clothing are just up and down, straight up and down. And I don't know about you, but my closet normally doesn't look like that. So we probably want to have more examples of clothing in different orientations. So for this, our model will probably only reach about 80-ish percent accuracy, but if you run it for the full 100, then it'll go higher. So next up, we're going to see what our model does when we present it with a rotated image, in this case of a shoe. And as we can see, label number two is a pullover. This is a shoe, so that is the wrong label. And so last up for this example, we will run our images through the data generator in order to change their orientation so that we can retrain our model. So as you can see from just 10 rounds of training, our accuracy has taken a significant hit because we're showing our model images that it's never seen before and it's being forced to learn them in different ways than it is used to. However, if we keep training it like this, it will continue to improve and be a much more robust model than the one that we had originally developed with our synthesized data. For our last tutorial, we're actually going to leave this collab notebook and go over to the TensorFlow website in order to look at a tutorial on generative adversarial networks. And the main reason why I didn't put this in the collab notebook is because they actually have a collab notebook with this code here for you. So if you'd like to try it yourself, you still can. And because I thought that they did a great job of presenting this already and didn't feel the need to reinvent the wheel. So this tutorial will take you through the process of creating a generative adversarial network and creating synthetic MNIST digits. So synthesized handwritten numbers, similar to the fashion MNIST data that we were working with earlier. And that might be an interesting example for anyone who needs a larger data set than the MNIST data set, but also an interesting example of exactly how close you can get an image to look like something from the actual MNIST data set. In fact, you can see here that they make a GIF of the generated images as the model trains and improves. And at first they're very fuzzy and very bad, but towards the end, they start to look like something resembling numbers. So if you have time, I'd highly recommend checking this tutorial out as well because it's a bigger and more complex model and it provides you with an interesting example of synthesizing your own data. On that note, these are three relatively straightforward examples of making synthetic data. But as the task that you're trying to do gets more complicated, synthesizing your data can actually get more complicated too. For example, when I spent a summer at Stanford, we were interested in developing a machine learning pipeline for MRI reconstruction, specifically focused on identifying artifacts or errors due to reconstruction in our images and then having MRI systems retake that image in order to make sure that the image is correct. 
We had several sets of MRI data from patients, but the problem was that we didn't know which images had artifacts in them. And so I had to make a synthetic data set where I knew that there were artifacts in them in order to make a prototype classifier. The challenge here is that artifacts in MRI have to do with the physics of how MRI systems work and how they acquire images. And so in order to make a synthetic data set, I had to essentially replicate that process on my own. And after doing so, we were able to make a proof of concept model that could classify artifact images from non-artifact images. But if we wanted to move that model into the clinic, we'd have to have a data set of real MRI data with real artifacts that we knew were artifacts in order to make sure that it actually worked. In short, synthetic data can be a really useful way of giving you practice data sets to work on if you're just getting into machine learning, expanding your training data if you don't have enough data, or helping you solve those harder and rarer problems and making sure that your model is robust against them. However, while synthetic data in theory has the same distribution as the original data set that we're trying to model, after all, that's why we're using it, we do have to be careful that we don't use models trained on synthetic data in real life without checking to make sure that it works on real life data too. This tutorial was made possible by Weights and Biases. Weights and Biases makes fast and easy to use developer tools to help you track, visualize, and optimize your deep learning projects. In fact, their library is being used by companies like OpenAI to track ongoing research. I'd highly recommend them to anyone at any stage in their machine learning journey, and if you're working on an open source academic or personal project, you can use Weights and Biases for free. Get started on your own ideas or use their reports to improve your skills and understanding of anything from language models to music generation. And if you have questions or just want to chat, you can join the Weights and Biases community. Even if you aren't interested in developing machine learning models yourself, Weights and Biases hosts regular podcasts and webinars on a variety of topics. So if you like my videos, you'll probably like them too. Gallery by Weights and Biases is a place where anyone can read and publish curated machine learning research tools and best practices. It's the ideal publishing platform for ML because you can augment your writing with model predictions, metrics, and custom charts. Check out the gallery for new posts every day. If this sounds interesting to you, sign up for Weights and Biases using the link in the description to start tracking your machine learning projects in less than five minutes today. Otherwise, if you like this video, you can let me know by smashing the like button and subscribing to my channel. You can also check out the rest of my AI 101 series on this playlist. If you'd like to learn more about my day job, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and I'll see y'all on Monday. Bye.